Hello, and welcome back to the Alexander Society. This is a podcast about drinking, where we talk about history on occasion. I'm your host, a humble monk hiding in the basement of a monastery and praying to my god that the ravaging barbarians outside give me a swift death, Derek, joined by my co-host, the ravaging barbarian outside, Tim. How are you doing, you filthy heathen? Holy shit, Derek. I wasn't ready for that. I'm doing good. Um, <laughs> how about yourself? How about yourself? Okay, yeah. So I, I'm doing I'm, I'm doing fine, I guess. But I've got an awful... He- I forgot to mention earlier. I have an awful headache right now because I got some new glasses to, this morning. And the prescription's a lot harsher than my last ones. And I'm having trouble adjusting to it. Yikes. I've been there, though. It's not fun. But other than that, I'm doing absolutely fantastic. So, Derek, what are you drinking tonight? I'm drinking some of the stuff that you gave me uh, last time we we hung out. Uh, I've got some of that Scarlet Ibis Trinidad rum. Only a couple. Sh- There's literally a shot. It's like a shot, Derek. Uh, I, I could squeeze two shots out of that, but I knew it wouldn't be enough. So I'm also, once I'm out of that, I'm doing that uh, Exotico uh tequila and then for the drinks i'm doing uh the velvet antler the one from uh iron monk oh iron monk yeah i that's that's one of my favorite beers from them that's not like one of my you know obviously tim loves that it's a it's a sour (laughs) so tonight i am drinking something you gave me actually the i have la gritona yeah la gritona it and it smells delicious. I haven't got to take a shot yet because I wanted my first sip to be on live. Yeah, I think you were going to love it. I know you're a tequila guy, and that is the best tequila ever made. Um, So I've got a quick little tiny story about my beer choice. So I wasn't seeing anything at all at first at my local liquor store that I like stuck out to me, right? So I was going to grab just like a random cabin boys because I know they're a good brand. I wasn't seeing any sours, any ales I wanted, so I just grab something I knew that wouldn't offend me. That wasn't like a stout or wasn't like a darker beer or whatever. And then I turn around and I look at, Oh yeah, there's this little shelf to the side of the coolers that I forget about sometimes. So I go and look at it and I'm like, Ooh, there's this vanilla and cherry beer. That's not what I'm drinking tonight because it's not as local. I might have it on the next podcast, but I picked that up and then I go look around cause I still like looking at the store. Then I found, what looked amazing. So it's the, the one I'm drinking is revolver brewing, good old Texas brewing company. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's dim berries and it's a blueberry wheat beer. And it just, Ooh, I just, <laughs> I'm so ready for it. Yeah. I love revolver brewing and that sounds amazing. That sounds so good. <laughs> so Derek, what are our rules tonight? Yeah. So in this, our illustrious society, we abide by an ever changing set of rules. Rule number one. If I mention that a city has been destroyed in the course of our story, then we we are going to take a sip. And rule two is going to be if Derek mentions Danube, is that how it's pronounced? Danube. Danube, sorry. If Derek mentions the Danube River, we take three sips. And if I tell a popular story about the subject, and then I explain why that popular story is not true, then we're going to take a shot. And that's because the guy that we're talking about today has a lot of mythology around him because the he came from a culture that did not write stuff down. And so the only stuff that we have about him is all 1500 years old and written by the people that he was killing. So (laughs) Jesus. Yeah. All right. So who are we covering today, Derek? Uh, Before we get into the story, I'd like to start us off with a reading from the New Testament of the Bible. What? Yeah. Okay. Revelations chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. You got that? I did. How does that relate to our subject, sir? Hmm. Let's see. A crown, horses, a bow, and conquest. Let's see what that is in reference to. So, in 376 AD, 
the year of our Lord, a group of barbarians called the Goths appeared on the banks of the Danube River. We're starting off strong, I see. Jesus, you're going to give me not enough time to open her up before I have to sip. Oh, hold up. We still have a shot to take. Yes, we do. Kampai? Prost. What the fuck, Derek? That's almost sweet. What? It has like, right after you swallow it, it has like almost a sweet aftertaste than it gets yeah. to your normal tequila aftertaste. Yeah. I told you, it's not like any tequila you've ever had before. So what do you think of that Scarlet Ibis? Ooh, it is really good. It is more bitter than I was expecting, but it's it's really good. It didn't taste especially bitter for me for rum that I've had, but again, I'm not the rum person. Yeah, usually rum is supposed to be a little bit on the sweeter side. Um, oh, let's see. Oh, let's see, because it's it has some like toffee and tobacco flavors. It's it's supposed to be a little more dry. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So, in 376 AD, a group of barbarians called the Goths appeared at the banks of the Danube River, which was the northern border of the Eastern Roman Empire. The Goths, in the 3rd and 4th centuries, lived in what the Romans called the Pontic Steppe, which is today western Ukraine and parts of Romania. It's along the Black Sea coast. These Goths were very scared of something, and they were fleeing because they had been displaced from their homeland. They requested permission from the Eastern Roman Emperor Valens to settle in Roman lands for their protection in exchange for fighting in the Roman armies. So basically, Valens would give them some farmland. They'd fight in the Roman legions. It was a, that, that was the typical trade. Okay. Uh, where was their homelands? It was the Pontic Steppe. It's like, like modern day, like Western Ukraine and Romania. So yeah, the so the Emperor Valens, uh, he accepted these Goths coming into the empire and settling. But after they crossed the river, uh, they were basically set up in like this refugee camp. And they were there for months. And at the time, the Roman, the Eastern Romans were suffering from a, um, uh, what was it? Like a, oh, what's the word? Um, uh, they didn't have enough food. Okay. Famine. Yeah. Famine. That's it. So they were suffering from a famine and they didn't have enough food to feed the Goths that were coming over. There were about 100,000 of them. And on top of that, the Roman officials and all of the legion officers that were helping facilitate their movement over were like abusing them and ex extorting them for what little provisions that they did have. Like there were stories about uh, the Roman officers would be um, selling the starving Goths food and as pay like as payment they'd get like one dog that they could uh they could pick apart for meat and the payment would be them they'd sell one of their children into slavery so that kind of thing they were being abused by the roman officials and so after a few months of that they got fed up and they ended up rebelling against the empire before they even got a chance to get settled the resulting conflict would rage for six years, devastating the Balkan provinces of the Western Empire, or I'm sorry, the Eastern Empire. Uh, something else to explain. Um, by this time, like closer to the end of the Roman Empire, uh, the empire had been split up into two halves. So you still had the empire on the East, the Western Empire, which originally was based in Rome. And then for a while, they moved the capital up to Milan. And then after that, they moved it to Ravenna in northeast Italy. So that they still had the Western Empire. And then they also had the Eastern Empire with, with its um, its capital was at Constantinople. But it was technically all the same empire, but the the governments were separated. Okay. Even though they kind of were still, yeah. It's one of those separate, but not separate at the same time. Yeah, like they were still considered the same entity, but they had their own independent. So wait, is it kind of like China and Taiwan right now? It's not like that. It's more like, oh, how would I? Like if, I don't even know how to describe it. I don't think there's ever been anything quite like the the divided Roman Empire because they had like the Eastern and Western emperors. They had an emperor for each side and they were, they still considered themselves one whole Roman Empire, but they had their own separate government bureaucracies. They had their own separate taxation systems. They had their own separate armies. They had their own separate, uh, like foreign diplomacy. Interesting. They still considered themselves and they still acted like they were all part of the same sort of unit, even though they, in all like practical terms, they were very separate. 
And so what the the Roman Empire we're dealing with right here is the Eastern Empire based out of Constantinople. Okay. And now the Goths are rebelling. I mean, to be expected after being treated like that. Oh, yeah. They were treated like the, the Romans were bastards. The Romans were awful people. But uh, so at the Battle of Adrianople in 378, the Emperor Valens was killed and an entire Roman army of 20,000 was destroyed. This was one of the worst military defeats for the Romans since like the Battle of Teutoburg Forest in like the like right around like zero, like the year zero. Okay. Um, it was like within a few decades, like during the reign of the first emperor Augustus um, was the last time that an, a Roman army had been beat this bad. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, peace was finally made in 382 with the original terms implemented, which was allow the Goths to settle in the Balkans in exchange for their military service. This war severely hurt the prestige of the Romans, and it's seen as the start of barbarian migration into the empire and kind of the beginning of the end for Rome. All right. But in the aftermath of the war, a major question was very big on Romans' minds. What could have motivated the Goths to abandon their homes and seek refuge in the empire? What force of God could have scared these warrior people so much that they were forced to flee to the protection of Rome. You want to take a guess? I could, but it'd be absolutely wrong, and I have no idea what to guess. Okay. The Huns. Oh, wow. I was going to be right. I was going to guess the Huns. Yeah, the Huns. The Huns were a horse people of the steppes. And the step steps are basically just, they're just miles and miles. They're like field oceans of uh, grassland, basically. There's just entire areas of like Central Asia and Eastern Europe that are just like 100,000 square miles of nothing but like not even trees, just nothing but grassland and rolling hills. That's what a step is. OK, um, the Huns probably originated from somewhere in Central Asia, most likely modern day Kazakhstan. But it's also been speculated that they're from further east in Mongolia. Their society consisted of tribes that were led by warlords who would confederate into larger groups. And these larger group, these larger confederations would have kings who maintained their power by ensuring the loyalty of these warlords, which they did through mil conquest and military victory. So the more you con the more you conquer, the more wealth you get, the more wealth the king can give to the warlords, the more the warlords support the king. It's that that's kind of how they're working working they were a nomadic people their e economy revolved around pastoralism which basically just meant that they would they herded cattle and sheep and stuff like that and they just take their herds of cattle with them wherever they went interesting i i how how hard would that be to travel with your cattle like that um it's it just be like uh because even today like ranchers can herd cattle on horseback it's a really easy well, I'm aware of that, but like, I, I just, it's, I feel like it'd be harder if you're always moving is what I'm getting at. It might be, but these people were born and raised in this, in this sort of setup. So it, it came kind of naturally to them just because they were kind of raised in it. Um, and it seemed to work really well for them because they were fucking scary people and were very, had like very effective at everything that they did. Um, so I'm going to take a wild guess since we're talking the Huns, it's Attila the Hun. You got it. Yeah. So there's I real quick, I'm looking at the spelling of Attila the Hun and I would have never imagined it. That's how Attila is spelled. What? A-T-T-I-L-A? Yeah. Yeah. I get, when I first started like writing my script, I kept messing up his, his name because I wanted to put one T and two L's. It got really frustrating really fast. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So one one there's a, there was a popular story about the Huns that's and the, it's the same thing about like any nomadic people that pop up in history like the Mongols and people like that. Um, it it goes that young Hunnish boys would learn how to ride a horse before they even learned how to walk, and from a young that has to be a hyperbole, right? It's probably a hyperbole, but not by much. Okay, they they started riding on horseback very early in life. About as young as Alexander supposedly did? Probably earlier. Okay. They Yeah, they probably would have 
it wouldn't have been unreasonable to expect them to start riding horses around the same time they started walking. Well, I make that because his famous story about his horse, he was what, like six, right? He was like nine. I can't remember. Okay. He had to have been riding for longer than that because just being able to hop on a horse and break it like that, there's you have to have some kind of training to be able to know to get on a horse like that. Yeah, probably. Um, and the Macedonians that Alexander was from, they were, they were uh, a culture that had a long tradition of horseback riding and cavalry as well just kind of kind of similar to like how the huns were so it wouldn't have been unreasonable to see him like uh it would have been, it wouldn't be unreasonable to make that sort of connect like uh like comparison um but yeah so uh in addition to learning how to ride horses uh they also trained from a very early early age to use uh compound bows okay and these bows these bows would be made from a framework of um a, f- a frame of hardwood with, that was inlined with like dried ten like dried tendons from horses or cattle and with bone and ivory and it gave these bows such an immense draw strength that it, the arrows were able to pierce metal plate armor and chainmail jesus yeah and if you were if you're an adult and you're picking up one of these bows for the first time there's a very good chance you wouldn't be able to pull it You'd have to start off from a very young age, building up the sort of muscles that you'd need to use these bows. Jesus. And so all of these factors combined made the Huns one of the fastest and most powerful armies in the ancient world. They were almost unstoppable on the battlefield. The Romans first heard about the Huns during the Hunnic invasion of the Goths uh, into their homeland in the Pontic Steppe. It was met with some concern by the Romans, but most of them just kind of thought that it was an incursion by like a known, a nomadic group that they already knew about. Like the Scythians were a popular, the the Scythians are kind of the, in the Roman world, they were the prototypical like barbarian horse people from the plains. Uh, But the full scope of what the Huns were came around in the summer of 395 when Hunnish raiding parties came down east of the Black Sea through the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, They looted, they plundered, and they destroyed cities and settlements in Syria and Armenia. I mentioned destroyed cities. Do you want to count that one? Yes. It's only going to count as one, though, because you didn't specify other cities. Yeah. Oh, I promise we're going to have plenty of them. See, when I first saw that rule, I had no idea what you were talking about. My only guess was, is in the late 1800s and early 1900s i know a lot of american towns because of how poorly they were built burnt to the ground or were destroyed because of it wasn't really good infrastructure and that was my only like guess but i was like he gave me some very specific things i don't think that's related yeah we're (laughs) um yeah no the the destruction of these cities is going to be very deliberate but also um you might notice that this in, that my introduction to Attila is is getting pretty long. There's a good reason for that. Um, this this episode isn't just about Attila specifically because Attila's own story is actually pretty short. Um, he had a pretty long life, but the sources on him were so scant that there's not a lot we can piece together besides like the broad strokes. But this is going to be a larger story about not just not just Attila, but the the empire that was built before him, the empire that he led, and what happened to the Romans as a consequence of his life and his actions. So, yeah, so the the first hint that the Romans had about what the Huns were and what this actually meant was when they came down and destroyed cities and settlements all through Syria and Armenia. The Romans were unable to confront the Huns because at the time that that was happening, they were dealing with a revolt by the Goths under the leadership of their new general king, a guy named Alaric. So all of their all of their armies were over dealing with Alaric and the Goths, and they couldn't deal with this these random people coming out of nowhere and raiding in in Syria. Well, I mean, if you're distracted one where. If an enemy comes in and attacks your weak side, you're not going to be able to do anything about it because you're busy. Yeah, you basically just describe why the Roman Empire fell. Uh, So in the year 401, we get our first named king of the Huns, a man named Olden. That year, the Eastern Emperor, a guy named Arcadius, tried to use the well-established Roman strategy of divide and conquer 
by allying with the Huns in order to suppress Alaric and his Gothic army. That ended up forcing the Goths uh, out of the Eastern Empire into the Western Empire, where they started to pillage over that way. Um, as a as a side, this is relatively important, but not particularly important to the story. After they were forced out of the Eastern Empire, they went west and they ended up sacking Rome. Oh, dear. the like the city of Rome, and that was the first time that that was the first time that Rome, the city, had been sacked since three thirty nine BC. Oh goodness. Over almost 700 years prior. No, not at all. So that was not a good omen. Um, it was around that time that the Huns settled down into a more permanent headquarters in the plains of modern day Hungary. By that time, uh, by the way, Hungary and Huns, no relation in the name. It's just a coincidence. I had never thought of that. I understand why people would make the connection, but I never did, to be honest. Yeah, there are a lot of Hungarians who believe that uh, their their na- their nation is descended from the from the leftovers of the Huns. Uh, but it's it's not backed up by like anthropological or genetic studies. They're they're descended from a group called the Magyars, which were they were another different nomadic group that came after the Huns. Okay. Anyways, so by that time, the Huns already had a firm hold over the remaining peoples of Eastern Europe. Basically, anybody east of the Roman Empire in Europe were under the control of the Huns. The Hun strategy was to use raids and victories on the battlefield in order to displace huge numbers of people in the regions that they conquered. And so once these regions were depopulated, their governments would be weakened and the Huns would come in and just collect tribute from them. And so this this tributary system effectively incorporated these subject tribes into the larger Hunnish confederacy. And so that is what built up the, the Hunnic empire. But of course, those refugees had to go somewhere. Of course. And that's... Yeah, and so that somewhere was almost always to the perceived security of the Roman borders. That doesn't last for long, does it? About a century. Oh, dang. <laughs> Which in the, in the timeline of the Roman Empire is a not a lot of time. It's longer than I expected, though. Yeah, but it the Roman Empire was very powerful. It took a while to knock it down, but it yeah, it eventually happened. Um, it's a matter of debate whether that this was like a deliberate... Sh- oh, gotcha. Yeah, so it's um it's a matter of debate whether this this strategy that they had, whether it was deliberate or if it was just a consequence of the fact that the Huns needed allies while they pushed west and just kind of collected them as they went along. But either way, by the early fifth century, they already had something resembling their own empire building up in Eastern Europe. Over the following decades, the Huns and the Romans had a complicated relationship. And that was that was despite the popular view in Roman society that Huns were like the the prototypical demonic barbarian. Like the average Roman didn't think there was any redeeming qualities to the Huns at all. They thought that they were the pure embodiment of just pure barbarism. Uh, But despite that, the Roman government itself and the Huns sometimes worked together. Basically, the Huns, their their policy was wherever they could get the most gold was where they would turn their attention. I mean, that, that how many people was that throughout history? Yeah, that's that's basically what the Romans did, too. They just put like a veneer of like ideology on top of it. Uh, but for the Huns, sometimes that would be through raiding Roman settlements and sacking cities and stuff. But just as often as that, it would be through selling their services as mercenaries to Roman armies. And the, the Huns ended up being very decisive in several Roman civil wars and in conflicts against the Goths that had just migrated into the territory, along with some other, uh, there were a bunch of other Germanic tribes that were starting to migrate in as well, like the the Franks, the Alans, um, the Saxons. I just said Alans. The Alans weren't Germanic. It, never mind. <laughs> it's interested. You're not drunk enough, Derek. Interestingly, the Alans were actually another nomadic people that were related to Persians that ended up in Europe somehow. That's a, but that's another story. They were never impo- that that important. Okay. Um, we have no idea when Attila was born. It was probably in or around the year four hundred six, but that's just a guess. We really don't know. He was probably born in the Hungarian plains where the Huns were making their headquarters. 
uh, his father, who was this guy named Munzuk. Uh, Munzuk was the younger brother of the kings that came before Attila. Oktar, these two guys named Oktar and Rua. Attila had an older brother named Bleda. And the two boys were raised like every other Hunnish boy. They learned horseback riding, lassoing, archery, sword fighting. It's also very likely that both of them were taught to speak and maybe even write both in Latin and in Gothic in addition to their native Hunnish language. And as young men, they, as they came up in age, they hit puberty. They started training to be leader, war leaders. Uh, they developed their leadership skills by leading like small raiding parties into tribal lands uh, north of the Danube. That's another Danube. Danube is three. Um, Are we going to die, Derek? <laughs> it's going to come up a lot, but not as much as you think as it, you're getting the impression of now. But like they're they're settled basically on the banks of the Danube River right now. So and that's where they're going to keep coming back to after everything we talk about. So it, it comes up a few several times, but that's why I made it the three sip instead of the shot. That's fair. <laughs> Could you imagine? Okay, Tim, here's 12 shots throughout the episode. Oh, yeah, it'd be a nightmare. <laughs> um, so the Huns uh, had a tradition of plural kingship, which basically means that if the previous king died and he has multiple sons, then it would it would be expected that the sons would rule as kings together. They'd all inherit the throne. How? how what? what? How? Did, so, does it work like a council? How? How did that work? Because that that genuinely e- piques my interest. I was trying to find the right word because my brain's fried today. I didn't get a lot of sleep. Yeah, something you have to keep in mind is that because they're a nomadic people and their society is based on like these fractured individual like clans. Okay, so they would basically form their own clan is what I'm going to assume? No, because once these clans were confederated, there was just one king. They'd only ever have one or there was there was a ruling king over. But it. uh, okay. how do I explain this? Um, (laughs) It's complicated and we can skim over it. (laughs) But yeah, but because because their society was made up of all of these different flak fractured clans that all very highly valued their own independence a lot of the inheritance of positions of power like this uh were very ad hoc they were kind sometimes even like made up on the fly they they weren't like written in stone because they weren't like a settled people with um with like tradition or with like uh, traditions of like ceremony for uh, ceremony for the court or like in a, like a tradition of kingship. And so, and so the, the position of King, there's even been some discussion on like whether the term King is even appropriate for describing them. Would it be more accurate to say like a tribal leader, like the chief? It's like, it's like a chief of chiefs. If that makes sense. It's a chief who rules over the other chiefs. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a very, It's a formal position, but it's treated informally because there's not a lot of ceremony that goes along with it. They develop ceremony over time, but for the like early in this this stage, they didn't have like set laws governing like inheritance or tradition or anything. Um, If somebody is made king is or if somebody is king over a confederation of Huns, it's because they're well respected for their ability in battle and. It's it's expected that when the king dies and he passes it on to his sons, that his sons will carry on that same tradition. And so there's it's not really based on the inherited. Yes, that makes sense. Like, I I totally understand where you're coming from on that. Um, I think it's a lot simpler, but a lot more complex compared to normal than we're thinking of. And it'd probably take us forever to get into it. Yeah, think think of it like this with a like a settled kingdom or like an empire like the Romans, uh, you had one throne for one emperor. And once that was passed down, um, then that was passed down to, like, say, the oldest son or whoever, whoever, uh, like you know what I mean, uh, because the throne was kind of treated as property and property is treated with in, like inher- there's like inheritance law that goes with that. The Huns didn't treat the throne of the 
Hunnic Confederation as property. They treated it as, as it, it was it wasn't based on like the granting of lands or the granting of titles or anything. It was a position of leadership that was predicated on them doing a good job leading. I mean, I get what you're uh, coming. Wow. Where was my brain going? Cause it literally rebooted as I opened my mouth. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So it's, it's not something that we're, that's what's so crazy about like nomadic horse people like this is, is that they, their way of life is so alien to the way that we live that we can't comprehend that we have a hard time wrapping our heads around like their, tr- their cultural traditions and their, their political formations because they're based on the way that they live their lives, which is a nomadic, always, always on the move. They don't have a concept of like landed property or anything like that. So it, it affects their political formations in ways that we just can't have a hard time wrapping our head around. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so whenever a previous king would die, the the crown would go to all of his sons or any any number of his sons that accepted it because sometimes some wouldn't accept it or sometimes someone would for- be like a younger brother might be forced to not accept it. Stuff like that happened. Again, very impromptu, ad hoc sort of inheritance. Uh, Munzuk was kind of that case. Uh, Attila and Bleda's father, Munzuk, was the youngest brother to the previous kings. And when the previous king, Ru- when the last king, Rua, died, Munzuk was already dead. And Rua didn't have any sons to pass the kingship on to. Uh, some sources claim that Rua did actually have children. Uh, and if any of them, and if any of his children were sons, then they were probably killed after Rua's death because Attila and Bleda ended up rising to the throne of the Hun Empire in 434 AD. So a lot of complicated stuff there. You kind of following so far? Yeah, as much as I can without being properly knowledgeable in the subject, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, so base, you know, here's the important part. Attila and his older brother, Bleda, became the co-rulers of the Hunnish Empire in 434. From what little information that we have about both men's personalities, these brothers couldn't have been more different. Bleda, the older brother, was a partier, and he loved to joke and play pranks. And he was very blunt, both in his personal like conversations and in his leadership style. Uh I'm I know it's not good to compare yourself to that, but like that's literally how I am. I don't know how to be subtle, so I just like poop. It's out there. As you can tell from experience, Derek. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Bleda Bleda, he wanted to rule the empire through some good old fashioned force. And all he he demanded just a simple relationship from the people that he subjugated. Pay tribute or be invaded. It was as simple as that. If they paid tribute, they were on good terms. If they didn't, he'd invade, get them back in line, put them back on good good terms. Attila, on the other hand, was a very self-serious man. He didn't have much of a sense of humor, and he had a he had a very high respect for nobility and for status. He, if somebody had a title or they had nobility or they had like privilege within the community, he went out of his way to respect that. And there's, we're not quite sure on this part, but. Some some have claimed that he was also like a very religious person, that he was very pious. Um. So what would his religion have been? Ooh, that's a that is a tough question to answer. <laughs> we have no. Well, I, obviously not going to be Judeo Christianic vibe, but was it like was it kind of like Native American kind of like where they convened with not obviously just like the Native Americans, obviously, but where they. They commune with the earth and all that kind of stuff. Um, there's there's been two main theories. Um, one of the theories is that um, there there were some other nomadic tribes that had had interactions with uh, the Romans before the Huns arrived, like the Scythians. And the Scythians had like their own pantheon of gods that were like kind of sort of related to 
um, like the Greek and Roman gods, but not quite the same. Um, and then there's another, there's a theory, theory that the Huns might have had something similar through like cultural osmosis that they kind of picked up the worship of gods because um, there's been, there were several stories about Attila that he revered the God of war in his culture, but we have no idea what that God was because the Ro the Romans only ever associated it with Mars. They only translated it to, and they said Mars, even though it was probably, it was definitely not a Roman God. Um, but then the other theory is um, there's uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure on like the details of like how this faith worked, but there is another um, it was this other religion that was common amongst nomadic peoples, but like from further east, like in Mongolia, it was called Tang Tangriism. And they it was a it was sort of a cross between like a monotheistic religion and a sort of animistic religion where they uh rev so they had like the one primary god that was tangri and then there were other there were like spirits that lived throughout the world that they also revered but but most of their main their main worship went to the the god tangri um and so they're but again like we have no idea what his religion would have be what it would have been okay but yeah, it's been it's been speculated that he was he might have been very pious. He definitely acted very pious. That's that's not up for debate. He was it, religion was a very big part of his life. But whether he was serious about that or whether that was propaganda is lost to history. Um, he had a very harsh temper, but he had at the same time, he also had remarkable self-control. So if he was upset or offended in some way, he could keep it hidden very well. And he would end up acting on that anger in very calculated and often very cruel ways. He, he sought a different tact in rulership from his brother. Attila wanted to establish his authority deeper than just brute force. He wanted to, he had this idea of uniting the subjects of the Hun Empire behind a common idea that even the subject peoples could be that maybe he could make this his subjects forget that they were being forced to pay him by getting them to getting them to back like a like an idea of like something bigger than ourselves that kind of thing and specifically he wanted that thing they were backing to be himself um to do that, he he would, like I said, he acted very pious. And to the spiritual people of the of late antiquity who lived in the barbar the barbarian wastes, as the Romans would have called it, they were very spiritual, and they took uh, they took like appeals to the gods very seriously. And Attila. Very famously, he carried this ornate ceremonial sword that he claimed had been gifted to him by the god of war. And again, we have no idea who this god was, but whether it was a Hunnish god or whether he used like the local like German god of war or something like that. Um, but to, yeah, to the tribal people that he controlled, they, they took this claim very seriously. Okay. Um, so after. After ascending to the throne, the two brothers immediately went out conquering. Yeah, so they're they're now on the throne. They went out conquering. By the end of the 430s, the entire Danube River and the lands north for a few hundred miles were literally like all the way up to like the, the coast of the Baltic Sea. Uh they're there and before you continue, you owe me three sips. Yeah, you're right. So yeah, like the Empire that so the empire that they're inheriting and that they're expanding at this moment at its height stretched from the Danube River all the way to the coast of the Baltic and uh it stretched all the way from the Rhine River which was the border of the Western Roman Empire all the way down to the Black Sea basically everything that we call Eastern Europe it this this was an enormous landmass it is it is a a testament to like the 
organizational skill that the Huns had as a nomadic or like at this point, kind of a semi nomadic because they're kind of settled, but not quite. But like a, a, a traditionally nomadic people being able to organize an effective political system that united all of these lands together was just, it's just crazy to think about. So in 436, a Roman general by the name of Flavius Aetius, who had spent part of his childhood as a captive of the Huns and had a lot of powerful friends among the Hun, chi- Hun chiefs, including Attila himself. Uh, this this guy Aetius came to came to Attila and Bleda for help. Uh, basically wanted to recruit them, pay them as mercenaries and recruit them into the armies in order to help them dislodge several hostile groups that were settling in Gaul or what's now modern day France. Uh, one of these dude, one of these groups was the Goths, which we mentioned earlier. They had started, they had made their way over there and were now settling in Southern France. Um, and another group was this tribe called the Burgundians. What's interesting about the Burgundians is that so far since the Huns had arrived, the Burgundians had been the only people to win a battle against the Huns. And we're not quite sure how they did it, but we know it happened because the Huns really wanted revenge for it. So Attila and Bleda agreed to sending Hunnic warriors who would be under Aetius' command. And the following year, the Burgundians, that, that tribe I just mentioned, Okay. They they did not exist as a political entity anymore a year later. The Huns killed 20,000 men, women, and children from the Burgundian tribe. Holy fuck. 20, 000, this was a tribe with a population of only 40 or 50,000. They killed 20,000. Like close to half, if not half? Close to half. It is monstrous. Yeah, that's that's sickening. Yeah, there were there were a lot of survivors, but their tribe didn't have a government anymore after the a genocide. It was a genocide. <laughs> how can excuse me? How can you expect them to have a functioning government after losing that many people? Like, seriously. And so they were forced to they were forced to accept um in exchange for settling in in Roman lands in Gaul, they had to accept the same deal. We'd serve in the Roman armies in exchange for being allowed to settle in these lands. They were, that's what they were forced to do. So after the Burgundian genocide, the Roman and Hun armies turned their attention to southern France, where the Goths were now occupying a Ro- the Roman city of Toulouse. And that's not the, what the Romans called it. It was some Latin name that I didn't bother to write down because it was long and wouldn't have mattered anyways, but it's the modern day city of Toulouse. The Roman Hunnic force was just narrowly defeated at, at the battle at, while they were besieging Toulouse, uh, because the Roman commander Latorius was captured and executed during the battle. And a bunch of Huns got killed in the process. Yikes. Yeah. And so Attila and Bleda didn't take this defeat very well. They withdrew their troops back to Hungary and the Romans and the Huns, the cooperation between the Romans and the Huns would become a lot more rare after that. If you can, you know, if you can comprehend such a like no duh. crazy idea, you get a bunch of our guys killed. We're probably not going to work with you again in the future. But in the early 430s, there is a German tribe called the Vandals. The Vandals had been migrating through the Western Empire, through Gaul and through through modern day France and Spain, hopped on some ships and they headed down to the Roman controlled provinces in North Africa. They ended up invading and settling in the lands in like the western part of North Africa. So there's kind of a stretch between like Morocco, Libya, and Tunisia. The emperor at the time didn't have the resources to dislodge them. And so to protect the lucrative wheat trade, which fed a good portion of the empire, like Northern, all of Northern Africa, like from, uh, from like just the entire coast of Africa, from Egypt to Morocco, was it provided like ninety percent of all of the wheat and grain to the entire empire. Oh dang! Yeah, the 
these a lot of people don't really appreciate like there's a lot of deserts there but the parts that aren't desert are some of the most fertile farmland on the planet they grow a crazy amount of crops and losing north africa would have been a disaster economically and just like you know famine wise for for the empire and so they were forced to conclude a peace with the vandals that would allow them to settle in kind of the western part of north africa out of the way but the romans would still be able to keep the largest city in north africa carthage in roman hands this is all going somewhere i promise okay in 439 the vandals decided well we actually want carthage and so they invaded against against the terms of the truce from there after they captured Carthage, they set up their own little Vandal kingdom in North Africa. That's all. That's something wild. That this was a crazy time in uh, Mediterranean, European, African history. There was a German kingdom in North Africa. What? Yeah, that's what the Vandals were a German people, and they've just set up a kingdom in North Africa. Whoa, that needs to be talked about. On you need to tell me about that one day on the podcast as a topic. If you can work it in. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Um, there's another topic I have in mind that will definitely expand on that a little. Yeah. Okay. Um, so once they captured Carthage, they then used the Carthage as a base to launch invasion an invasion of the island of Sicily. So now they're threatening Italy itself, like the seat of imperial power. The Eastern Emperor Theodosius in Constantinople, Theodosius II, ended up having to draw troops away from the Danube frontier in order to defend Sicily because he didn't trust uh, what was going on in the Western Empire politically at the time. So like I, like I said before, the Eastern and Western Empires had like separate, separate diplomacy and separate militaries. But in situations like this, one empire could intercede on behalf of the other. And the the reason that Theodosius didn't trust the Western Empire at the time is because the emperor at the time was Valentinian III, who was a baby. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And the government was under the regency of his mother, a woman named Gala Placidia, who was very ambitious and very reckless and... You know, kind one of those women in history that pops up and she's just kind of a badass. And because she's a badass, she gets lied about for the rest of by historians for the next 2000 years. Goodness. Yeah. Um, And when I say badass, I don't mean to say that she was like a good person. She absolutely was not fucked up uh, monster. But well, isn't that usually the case? Like, oh, this person I think is really neat and cool. Oh, shit. They were a horrible monster. Yeah. Like. Like, I think Erwin Rommel was a badass. He was still a Nazi, but like in terms of the things he did, they were impressive, even though they were for at the absolute evil, most evil of a modern, like the last hundred years. But the, yeah, that's that's what I mean. So. So, yeah, so Theodosius II is sending troops from the frontier across that's basically defending from the Huns has to pull those troops away in order to go and defend Sicily. While the troops are pulled away, the Huns launch their largest attack into Roman territory yet. Like I said, that's that's how the Roman Empire fell. Okay. So their first target was they besieged the city of Margum, which was right on the river. And they, and they also, at the same time, they were besieging a local a fortress that was nearby, the fortress of Constantia. Theodosius attempted to negotiate a truce with Attila and Bleda, but the Huns were demanding. So basically in the Huns had this bad problem where uh, like prominent, either prominent members of the Hunnish, like, like upper class who had fallen on the King's bad side or like high ranking members of some of their subjects, some of their vassals, uh, if they got on the, the king's bad side, they would flee to the Roman Empire and seek asylum. And so periodically the Huns would come back and, to the emperor and demand that they return the refugees, re- that they'd return these refugees as like uh, bargaining, like a d- diplomatic. Okay. 
And so the Huns were demanding that refugees who had fled from their vassal states be turned over, which the Romans ended up refusing to do. And so after those negotiations fell through, uh, the people of Margam, the city that they were besieging, and there's this this other... I'm, this was such a hard episode to organize because even though it's short, there's so much packed into it. So the city of Margam had a bishop. And this bishop had been accused by the Huns of crossing the river and going into Hungary and desecrating Hunnic burial mounds uh, so that he could go grave robbing. We don't know if it was true. We have no way of knowing if it was true. Um, it's very easy. They probably could have easily just been lying. But, um, but so they were... So the Huns were demanding that the bishop be handed over. And so the people of Margam, once the negotiations fell through, the people of Margam tried to ward off the Hun army that was besieging their city by handing over the bishop. But before they could do that, the bishop ended up fleeing from the city. He snuck out in the middle of the night and went beyond the walls and ended up going to Attila himself so that he so that he could offer his services helping seize the city in exchange for his own life. That fucking yellow bad Hilly bastard. Yeah, he's kind of a piece of shit. <laughs> um, Attila swore on his fancy uh, gem-encrusted sword that if the bishop helped him seize the city, that he wouldn't hurt the bishop and he wouldn't hurt any of the townspeople. The bishop returned and successfully talked the garrison of the city into opening the gates, at which point the Huns swooped in and destroyed the city, killing or enslaving every single person there. The story goes that the bishop was the very first person to be killed. Honestly, it serves him right. Yeah, so that's a that's a dead city. Yep, I can't do that nearly as well as you can. It just sounds really cool when you say it. <laughs> yep. So this little invasion by the Huns ended up going on for the next year. They spent the year raiding all over the Balkans, looting and burning cities and villages, and very rarely leaving anybody alive or unenslaved. One of the cities that they destroyed was a, it was very culturally and spiritually important to the Roman people. It was the city of Nyasus, which is today the modern day city of Nish in Serbia, which is, I think it's Serbia's like second biggest city. But Nyasus was the birthplace of the emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor of Rome and was also the founder of the city of Constantinople. It was named after him. And uh, they just, they destroyed the city. <laughs> they just burned the thing to the ground. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, they wouldn't be able to rebuild that city for another hundred years. Yeah. A hundred years after that, the... Wow. The western half of the Roman Empire didn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah, by that point, that's that city was really deep in it was like really deep in the Roman and like Roman territory. But by the time it was rebuilt, it was almost a border town because of how far the borders had moved back. So, yeah. Um, so this uh, this little expedition of Attila's and Bleda's was finally was was finally they weren't forced to flee. But once the Roman army returned from Sicily in 442. And so the Huns ended up pulling back. Pulling, pulling back over the river and heading back home because they had a lot of they had a lot of slaves and they had a lot of gold now they they'd done what they came to do Attila's success in this campaign ended up bolstering his reputation amongst his own forces enough that he was now he was now comfortable challenging his brother for full control of the Hunnic Empire so now that they're back home a power struggle breaks out and we don't Again, I'm going to say this a lot. We don't know any details about this power struggle. Uh, we don't know whether it was like just a covert thing they were kind of doing under the table to kind of undermine each other, or whether it was like an open schism within the Hun, the Hun court. Uh, what we do know is that in 445, Attila's older brother Bleda went on a hunting trip and never came back. Ah, the good old hunting trip. The good old hunting trip. And so now 445, Attila is now the sole leader of the Huns. If you die on 
if you die on the recording, I think we're going to have to put a, like a higher, uh, like a parental advisory on it or something. <laughs> we're already un, uh, age restricted. We're already explicit. Oh, yeah, that's true. So in January of 447, this, okay, just before we get into this, this is a mind boggling story and I can't believe it's true. But every historian I looked at was like, yeah, this is. There's no reason to think that this isn't true, but this the story is fucking ridiculous. Is, is is this another one of those shield ramp stories that it it shouldn't be real, but it? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, it's exact same vibes. <laughs> okay, so in January 447, an earthquake struck Constantinople, the capital of the Eastern Empire. Besides the huge body count. The most terrifying thing about this earthquake was that it had destroyed large portions of the Theodosian walls. And the Theodosian walls were, they were the outer layer of the defensive walls that stretched for three and a half miles across the peninsula that the city was settled on. So the city was settled on the end of a peninsula and the Theodosian walls were three and a half miles of defensive fortification. And these weren't just like, piddly little walls either these were made of stone they were about i think they were 160 feet high 90 feet deep um had like like ballista and arrow towers uh kind of dispersed through these were serious uh, these were a huge deal these were like one of one of the most impressive architectural feats of the late roman empire and now enormous portions of them were in complete ruin and just wide open so any an army could just walk right through. Attila heard about this and he thought, hey, this seems like a good opportunity. And so once again, uh, this was about five years. Yeah, this was five years after the last expedition, two years after his brother's death. Uh, he launched another invasion. Uh, this time further east into Thrace with the intention of attacking Constantinople directly. So to protect this, to protect their city, there was this guy, he was the, his rank in his rank in the empire is the Magister Militum of the Eastern empire, which means that he was the overall commander of all of the armies of the Eastern empire. This guy's name was Flavius Constantinus. So Constantinus recruited these two groups. And bear with me, because this is going to sound fucking ridiculous. He recruited... Ah, holy shit. He recruited two groups, and what did he make the two groups do? Well, first, let me explain what these groups are. So in Constantinople, their big pastime was chariot racing. And they raced chariots in the Hippodrome and there were there were a bunch of different teams and they were all like color coded. Each each team had like a color. That's what they're they didn't have like mascots through different colors. The two biggest teams were the blues and the greens. And the these these chariot racing teams had to call them fan clubs doesn't quite get across what these groups actually were. They were a mix between like, you know, you know, like in England, like football hooligan clubs, like the like the soccer super fans. Oh, the people who are like um, I fan boys, like the cronyism, not cronyism. That wouldn't be the right term, like the overly devoted and loyal and unable to question or uh, doubt them. Yeah, like the the who like the who the, the football hooligans in England, they're like uh like they riot over like the results of games and things like that. You don't delude yourself into thinking our football is any better, Derek. It's not, no, but there's this very specific vibe that goes with like football hooliganism. Um but imagine like a mix between that, but they're also like street gangs. Interesting. And and then on top of that, they're also like political action committees. What? They're political groups, but they're also sports fan clubs, but they're also the 
like directly associated with the team. And then they also double as like hit squads in the streets. What the fuck? Yeah. This utterly bizarre. I've never seen anything like this any other point in history. But they've got these two groups. They're the Blues and the Greens. They support the different chariot racing teams. And they despise each other, naturally, because they're rivals. And when when I say despise, like stabbings and assassinations between these two groups are very common. But in this time of need, Constantinus decided that he would recruit these guys to help rebuild the walls before Attila could get there. Again, three and a half miles of the biggest walls you've ever seen in your life. And Attila's already on his way. Jesus. Attila is like a master at this shit. Attila is a force of nature. He is... I'll get I'll get a lot more into like just how much of a he was a genius. He really was a genius in his own way. Uh, but I, I will get I'll I'll break in I'll break down break that down a little bit more a little later. So the blues and the greens they get to work rebuilding this wall, but they're not making any progress at first because there's while they're working on the wall they're just constantly trying to kill each other because they hate each other because. <laughs> That's just how this worked for some reason. So Constantinus got an idea. Instead of letting them work together, he decided he was going to separate them. So he put them at opposite ends of the wall and then told each group, whichever one of your teams uh, completes more of the wall each day will get a bonus in their pay. And so he's turned it into a competition against one another. And so because they hate each other, they're working day and night as hard as they possibly can to get these walls complete. And this is the craziest shit. It works. What? They get they get all three and a half miles of these walls rebuilt in two months. 60 days. Holy crap. The some of the biggest walls ever built in Europe. They rebuild them completely in 60 days because the people building them were in a race against each other and just happened to hate each other. (laughs) So, yeah, the story goes that the day after the walls were finished, Attila arrived with his army at the walls of the city. And when he saw that the walls were back up, he just kind of turned around and went home. That's prop that's that probably didn't happen because. By the time that the walls were rebuilt, Attila kind of realized that he didn't really have a reason to take Constantinople. During this expedition, he sacked and destroyed at least seven important cities and carried off a bunch of loot and slaves. Yeah, so this campaign was already so successful that Attila really didn't feel any need to even risk besieging the capital city, which he knew would have been a nightmare for his armies because the the Huns, their big strength was in their mobility and their speed. They only sacked a city if they knew they could take it really quickly. Um, and they knew they were never going to be able to take Constantinople very quickly unless those walls were down. So I don't know if you noticed, uh, that was a story, a popular story about that was a city that got destroyed. Oh, that was a popular city that got. Yeah, it was both. Yeah. Wow. That was just dis... okay. So that's a shot. Yeah. So one sip, one one sip, one shot. Okay. Prost. Yeah. So Attila turns around, decides not to attack Constantinople after they pull off this amazing, impressive feat of engineering using the using the fifth century equivalent of football hooliganism. And so the Huns and the Romans signed a peace treaty and the Huns were able to force the Eastern Roman emperor to pay the Huns 2,100 pounds of gold a year, which 
which some some writers at the time say was like an insane amount of money that would have bankrupted the uh would have bankrupted the um, that bankrupted the empire and left a bunch of senators destitute and stuff like that but really it was like it was a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of money that they were spending like fighting wars that's honestly probably true like they'd spend that much in a month over the course of a dirt like when they're on campaign so it's it was a lot cheaper just to do that yeah so a couple years later in 449 we get one of the more interesting stories about attila and this story is really interesting because this is the only first hand account that we have of attila by somebody who met him wait really i know you said there wasn't a lot of first hand accounts but this being the first one yep this is the only one only one that's come down to us oh, oh only jesus christ Specifically, it was from a Roman, an Eastern Roman bureaucrat named Priscus of Panium. Priscus was accompanying a friend of his named Maximinus, who was, uh, he was a, he was an army officer, and he was appointed as a diplomat to Attila's court. Uh, Priscus was when Priscus arrived in Attila's court, he was very surprised to see that Attila kind of just looked like a normal guy and not like a demonic monster like he was expecting. Like everything depicts him to be, which is kind of stupid because obviously as much as you want to demonize someone, it's not going to, their look isn't going to reflect their uh, demeanor or like how bad of a person they are usually. Yeah. Yeah. He actually, he gives a physical description of what Attila looked like. Oh, hit me with it. I'm dying to find out what he looked like. It It's actually kind of disappointing. Um, he, he, he said, quote, He was short with a broad chest and large head. His eyes were small, his beard sparse and flecked with gray, his nose flattish, and his complexion dark. So basically he had like, he looked like a, like a 40-year-old guy. Yeah, basically. Like a like a forty year old Asian guy with a patchy beard. It's, uh, through through the writings of Priscus, Pris- he he emphasizes that many of the barbarian stereotypes that the Romans had about the Huns were very off base. Nah, yeah, <laughs> uh, the Huns. He points out the Huns were very sophisticated. They had a lot of elaborate ceremonies and cultural practices that they adhered to. They were clearly very highly organized, a very highly organized society. And they had like a clear noble class that and this this nobility enjoyed all of like the same wine and jewelry that high society people back in the capital did. Like there there were a lot of similarities between the Huns and the Romans, which makes sense because by this point, the Huns had been in contact with the Romans for a generation or two. Well, it's like, it's like cultural diffusion is going to happen no matter how at war you are with two nations or like anywhere, like you're going to pick up on certain things that other people do. It doesn't matter. Oh yeah. Yeah. And this, this period, this, the last century of the Roman empire is, you cannot understand anything that's going on during this period without understanding cultural diffusion. It has such an enormous impact on everything that's happening. Everybody is getting Romanized and anybody who isn't Roman is influencing the behavior and the ideas of the Romans. It's all going back and forth and it's affecting their decisions and it's affecting their diplomacy and their conflicts. And it's just woven through all parts of the fall of the Roman empire. It's such an important thing to understand when you're researching this and when you're learning and trying to understand this period of history. Okay. uh, Priscus, he also emphasized that Attila didn't strike him as like a violent brute. Like he was kind of, like the reputation that he had 
but instead Attila was very shrewd and calculating. But like like I've mentioned before, had a bit of a temper. Attila could even show hospitality on occasions if it suited his interests. If he wanted to make a good impression with someone, he could be very hospitable and very even very merciful. His general summary of Attila was that despite the rough edges of like his barbarian upbringing, he demonstrated many of the same traits that a lot of Romans would find admirable about their own like great leaders, like all the great emperors from Roman history. He was tactful, intelligent. He had amazing confidence and he had an attitude and a charisma that really inspired loyalty in people. Okay. I mean, let, let me get into an actual like response to that instead of my, yeah, okay. That makes total sense because there's no way someone like him could have been as successful as he is from what I've, like, I actually don't know a lot of direct about Attila the Hun, only that he was big, bad, and scary, but he had to have, to be as successful as I, we, I hear he was, he had to have been a good military leader. He had to be a, like, be able to work with his men, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He was in his own way. He was a politician just as much as he was like an effective commander. And he had to have all of the traits that went along with being a great politician. So it, it, of course it makes sense that he'd be described like this by somebody like meeting with him and interacting with him. And now, now here's where Priscus's story gets weird. So during the trip, during this diplomatic trip, it came to light that the Romans, the Roman delegations translator, this guy named Vigilus, had secretly been directed by the Emperor Theodosius to team up with one of Attila's bodyguards, this guy named Edico. And they were going to team up and assassinate Attila while they were on this trip. Oh, goodness. How will this go for them? Keep in mind, this is an eyewitness account of this event. <laughs> wow. And keep in mind, uh, Attila has another decade, at least, of his life left. I-, I assumed that this wasn't the end of Attila. I'm just wondering how badly the people who tried to kill him got fucked up. That's actually interesting, and I'll get into it. Oh? Before the plot could be put into motion, Etico, Attila's bodyguard, he confessed the entire thing to Attila. Oh. But it but Attila was plotting. He was he didn't want anybody to know that he knew. And he didn't want any of the Romans to know that he knew. So he didn't tell anybody that he knew about the plot. He just went he kept going on like things were just normal. And so he let he let the entire party, which Vigilus was the only Roman in the party who knew about the plot. The other guys, Priscus and Maximinus, they had no idea and they wouldn't even know until after the fact. But they kept going and Attila kept letting Vigilus like kind of try and put his plot into motion until the Huns could find something that they that was like that they could use as like irrefutable proof that this plot was going on. Vigilus ended up being caught with a giant bag of gold, like 25 pounds of gold. Oh, good. That was intended to be payment for Etico for participating in the plot. Vigilus ended up getting being arrested by the Huns, along with Vigilus' son, who for some reason was on this trip with him. But none of neither of them were killed. Instead, what Attila did was he let Vigilus' son go and return to Constantinople. And his son would be accompanied by two of Attila's bodyguards. And around the son's neck was the bag that had been used to hold the gold, but now it was empty. And so the two the two two of Attila's bodyguards that are being used as kind of impromptu diplomats took the son back to Constantinople and presented him at the court of Emperor Theodosius. And there 
the two of them, they offered to return the son completely unharmed. They offered to return Vigilus completely unharmed if they paid a ransom, the ransom being 25 pounds of gold like they had found in the bag. And they, and then they gave a personal message that Attila had given to be given directly to the Emperor Theodosius, basically saying that by being a part of this dishonorable plot, that he that Theodosius had reduced himself to the position of a slave. Oh, damn! And he demanded to. They demanded to all of the people, all of the rich and powerful of the Eastern Empire that were gathered in this court. He he spoke. They spoke to them directly and said, "Why?" And said, "Our king, our barbarian king Attila, has acted with honor." but your emperor has acted with complete shameful dishonor. So who of us is really the barbarian here? Shots fired. Jesus Christ. That would be enough of like a sick, like a burn, a sick burn on its own today. But the thing is, this was this, that message itself was calculated by Attila who knew that it would be said to the court in Constantinople, who were all the most rich and powerful people in the entire Eastern Empire, because that was Attila's great strength. It was diplomatic and psychological warfare. That is what he was so, so good at. I had to have been. Yeah, whenever whenever Attila looted cities and he raided farms, he didn't just do it for the wealth and the gold. He did it so that he could confirm his status in the minds of his subordinates. Winning, winning, conquering cities secured his position and secured his power. After he looted them, he would burn the cities so that he could undermine the Romans' arrogant view of themselves as unstoppable conquerors. What happens to an unstoppable conqueror when they're conqueror, when they themselves are conquered? They fucked. Yeah, they fucked. <laughs> Sorry, like, like that is like your whole reputation proceeds on using a lot of fear and intimidation to help you in situations where you're going to be overpowered, right? And they lost that. W- once that happens, once they've been conquered, they lose that, and a lot of their um, bluffing power, I guess you could say. Once you unveil the man behind the Wizard of Oz, there's no putting it back up. The secret's out. And in this instance, and this is this, Attila spared Vigilus and his son, but he did it in such a public way because he would have he would have had no compunctions about putting uh, putting them both on stakes or burning them alive, or anything he wanted to do to them. He would have had no problem to do. No problem with that. It's full. He did it many times. But he spared both of them, because he knew that if he did that in such a public way, that all of the most powerful people in the empire would be forced to start questioning the moral values that the entire Roman system was built on. Yep, exactly. They were the civilized, the Romans were the civilized, the other people were the uncivilized barbarians. That is the way of the world. If you tore that down, then the entire point of the Roman Empire was completely wrong. As it always was. So yeah, this that, that was an absolute body blow to Roman morale. It was It sent shockwaves all through the Roman political system. And it severely undercut the emperor's authority. It made it a lot harder for him to rule. Attila read the Roman psyche like a book, and he knew exactly where to strike to exacerbate their insecurities. He, Attila was a genius. It sounds like it. It sounds like he was a masterful tactician. He, he played amazing mind games, just from what you're telling me. Yeah, he was so good at mind games. He was crazy good at mind games. After this, we're going to get into easily one of the most famous moments in Attila's story. 
Yeah. So this 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 moment coming up, it's one of the most famous moments in Attila's story, but it's a little complicated, so bear with me. The Western Emperor, that guy I mentioned before, who was just a baby at the time, Valentinian the Third, he's grown up now. Or at least, you know, like late teens, I think. Um he had an older sister. Her name was Justa Grata Honoria or Honoria. And she was just like her mother, that lady I mentioned, Gala Placidia. She was extremely influential and a very ambitious woman and had a lot of power in the Roman court. Valentinian didn't like her having so much power in court because he thought he thought that she was undermining his authority. And so he wanted to get her influence in line. So he had her, Honoria, engaged to this minor landowner in the country of in Italy named Herculanus. And he wanted to do that because once she got married off, she would have to go live with him out in the country. And so she'd she wouldn't be spending any time in the court. And so she wouldn't be able to keep up all of her contacts and her diplomatic alliances and all of the things that she used to express power. So being far away from the court, she wouldn't be able to be, she wouldn't be powerful enough to interfere with his rule. So in a calculated move, Honoria sent a letter in 449 to Attila. In the letter, she said that she was a prisoner to her brother and she was being forced into a marriage that was below her station and requested that he intervene on her behalf to prevent her from having to go through with this marriage. The story goes that the letter included a silver ring and that Attila took the inclusion of this ring as a proposal. Oh, wow. In reality, there was probably a ring, but it was, but it was a sigil ring, which is one of those rings with like the crest that you would press into, press into wax to sign a seal on a, on a document. And Attila, so Attila knew full well that a Roman princess would never have any intention of marrying a barbarian king like him. And he, he knew the ring was probably, the reality was the ring was probably symbolic of an alliance or proof that the letter was from her and not from a third party trying to trick him. Um, that that was a uh, that was a shot, wouldn't it? Yeah, you're right, you're right. Compai. Prost. So... Even though this very obviously wasn't a proposal, nevertheless, Attila decided to push this opportunity so that he could see how far he could take it, and to see how f- see if the Western Romans still had the strength to push back. He sent a response directly to Valentinian's court in Ravenna. <coughs> Remember, like I said, the. The capital isn't in Rome anymore. The capital is in Ravenna now. Yes. So he sent a response to Valentinian's court in Ravenna saying that the Huns would not allow the marriage between Honoria and Herculanus. And instead, she was going to marry Attila. Some historians, like the later medieval writer Jordanus, writing a few centuries later, would claim that Honoria was smitten with Attila. But that's just a fabrication. In reality, Honoria was just looking for a foreign army that could enforce her status in the imperial government. And Attila wanted to have a direct line to the imperial family. Both of them were just trying to get power. Oh, God, that's another shot. I hate you, Derek. Oof. Sorry, bud. Come by. Prost. Uh, So Emperor Valentinian didn't have the resources to deal with a potential Hun invasion. And from his perspective, having Honoria out all the way across the Danube was even better for him than having her locked up in a country villa. Hey, we mentioned the Danube. So Valentinian decided that he was going to go ahead and concede to Attila 
and he was going to hand over Honoria. But before he could, their mother, Gala Placidia, ended up stepping in and forcing him not to. And so that ended up falling through. Which, as it turns out, was exactly what Attila wanted. Because now Attila had leverage against the Romans. He had a claim to Honoria that she was rightfully his wife. And in his mind, the time was right to start knocking the Western Romans down a peg. He was probably hoping to get like a similar concession out of them that he had gotten, gotten out of the Eastern Emperor. With, you know, like, like 2,100 pounds of gold a year. Something like that. In the year 450, just the, the year after, he sent an, and Attila sent an embassy to Ravenna that formally announced Attila's engagement to Honoria. And then also, and this is really weird, he demanded that Honoria be elevated to the position of co-ruler of the empire alongside her brother basically demanding that she be made emperor alongside Valentinian. Attila knew full well that Valentinian would never accept this deal. Not only was Honoria already married to Herculanus by that time, and being good Christians, uh, they were strict monogamists, but a woman being elevated to the rank of Augustus was absolutely out of the question. I mean. Can you imagine a woman running a whole country? You, you imagine that? It's it's ridiculous. Derek, your misogyny is showing. <laughs> and so Attila had his pretext for war. And a Hun army was on the march in early 451. Their target was the weakest part of the Western Empire, which was Gaul, or modern-day France. His army in this expedition wasn't just made of Huns, but also included uh, levied troops from all of the different tribes that the Huns had vassalized so far, including a group of Goths, which had remained north of the Danube when the migration started. So there, at this moment, there were two groups of Goths. There were the ones who had migrated into the empire and were now settled in like southern Gaul, and then there were the ones that were still north of the Danube and were vassals of the Huns. Valentinian was forced to make an alliance with the Goth king Theodoric, who was settled in southern Gaul. And they agreed that if the emperor recognized Goth southern sovereignty, then they would fight the Hun invasion together. And this is this is the crazy this is the crazy shit that Attila's campaign in France is legendary now like literally like shrouded in legend okay it's it's his his most famous moment by far it was the moment that secured his reputation as the demonic barbarian and killer of christians that would forever be his legacy in christian memory dozens of saint stories of martyrdom came out of the destruction caused by the huns in france Attila is probably responsible for making more Christian martyrs than any other single person in human history. Jesus Christ. Yeah. The city of Metz in eastern France was the first city to be destroyed. One story says that the chapel to St. Stephen was the only building that wasn't destroyed. Next was the city of Reims, where, as the story goes the bishop, Nicatius, was reciting Psalm 119 as the city was sacked. In the middle of his chanting, he was decapitated. But as his head rolled down the steps of the cathedral, it kept reciting the verse. <laughs> he is now recognized as Saint Nicatius. Wow. There's no way he would continue to recite this verse, though. That that doesn't. That's not possible. Yeah, so that's, that's that's how most hagiography is. Um, actually, I want to look up um, Psalm one nineteen real quick, just to give you an idea of what it was he was saying. 
Blessed are the undef blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do not inquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned the righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes, so forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. And God, it's so long. Never mind. <laughs> Jesus, why does it keep going? That's scripture. There's 176 lines. Why did I not know this? Yeah, the scripture. Jesus, what the... F yeah, so anyways, imagine that, but like in Latin, and that's what he was saying. There's another story that this story is... it. It's a crazy story, and it also gave Attila probably his most badass nickname. Okay. And it came out of an apocryphal encounter at the town of Troyes. When the Huns arrived at the city gate, the bishop of the town, Lupus, called down from the wall, Who are you? And Attila responded, I am Attila, the scourge of God. Holy shit. Yeah, when he says scourge of God, he's referring to a whip. That's, that's a literal translation from Latin. He's saying he's the the whip of God, but liter more metaphorically, like he is God's punishment sent down upon you. Oh, goodness. I am Attila, the scourge of God. And so now that's one of his most famous nicknames. He's, he's a scourge of God. The Bishop Lupus and his citizens accepted their fate. And they opened the gates and allowed the Huns to enter the city so that they could all die with dignity. But then when, according, of course, according to the story, when the Huns crossed the threshold of the walls, all of the Huns were blinded. By what? They just, they just suddenly lost their eyesight when they entered the city. And then when they finally left the threshold of the city, they got their eyesight back. Yeah, I don't buy it. Yeah, probably not. But Lupus is also a saint. How many saints did Attila the Hunt? Dozens. Seriously? Dozens. If you believe, if you believe one story, eleven thousand. What? Though that story was a insane mistranslation. How in the hell? There were only. It's a story about um, eleven women who were on a pilgrimage from who were coming back from a pilgrimage to Rome and ended up like, uh, I think they were martyred by the Huns in somewhere. I don't know, but um, at some point, uh, some monk somewhere uh, mistranslated the Latin. He thought it said 11,000 women when it was really only 11. Um, but at one point, the church actually recognized all 11,000 nameless women as not not as saints, like only the leader. I forgot her name, but only the leader was actually a saint. But the rest of them were like blessed, uh, like a lower rank on the way up to being a saint. I was about to say, I didn't think there was ever even close to that amount of saints. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating for dramatic effect, but. But yeah, it's. Uh, there were so many, at least a couple dozen saints were born out of the, just this one campaign that lasted less than a year. Less than a year? Yeah. Holy shnike, he's Batman. Yeah, because he set off in early 451, uh, Attila did, and he would be back in Hungary by late summer of 451. Goodness. Yeah, he's destroying all of... He is destroying all of these cities in the course of like six or seven months. How are, are how accurate is that timeline? It's accurate. Yeah, it's one hundred. Like we wow. Like that's that's not a dispute because that that was the Huns' great strength was they were super fast. That just feels like that's like oh it happened about six months. You know. Yeah. Well, it 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 takes a shockingly short amount of time to destroy a city, as it turns out. 
it only takes two or three days to like fully burn a city to the ground and loot it of all its valuables if you have an army big enough. I mean, I guess. So the first real like military confrontation came when the Huns were approaching the city of Orleans, or, or Orléans in French, in June of 451. The Huns were approaching the Roman Gothic army, like the combined Roman Goth army. They were approached by this army in a field in what's now the Champagne region in central France, which is referred to in history now as the Catalonian Plains. The Romans were led by the empire's greatest general and Attila's old friend that we mentioned earlier, Flavius Aetius, while the Goths were led by their king Theodoric, who was the son of the great Gothic king Alaric, who was the man who sacked the city of Rome in 410. There, this, this combined force was also joined by a contingent of Burgundians, the survivors of the Huns' genocides two decades before. Jeez. By all accounts, the Battle of the Catalonian Plains was horrifically bloody for both sides. During the battle, the Gothic king Theodoric was killed. The day ended without either army abandoning the field, and so it was a stalemate. But the Huns were unable to continue their forward push, and so the following day, or actually two days later, they were forced to flee back east, and they ended up returning to Hungary. This seeming defeat for the Huns wasn't... so. This battle, the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, is considered one of the most famous and like great important battles in the entire history of the Roman Empire. It's one of the most studied, one of the most like well known. Okay. It this is where I'm going to there's a lot of I I'm drawing from a lot of scholars who I agree with, but this is a little bit of my opinion. It's a very overrated battle. How so? A lot of historians have severely overinflated its importance because they they look at it and like this is the moment that the Huns were the Huns were finally beat on the battlefield and were finally pushed back. And it was the beginning of the end for the Hunnic Empire. And that's that's not what was going on at all. If anything, it was the beginning of the end for the Roman Empire. Um because Attila it was very probable that Attila had already made up his mind that he wasn't going to stick around in France. By that point, this battle was probably more of like a rear guard action to get them off of his ass so that he could finally get out. Because, again, like I mentioned earlier with a lot of his campaigns, he would looted a bunch of cities. He already had the gold and the slaves. What more did he want out of that? That's what he came for. <laughs> And so he was probably already on his way out when the battle was fought. And so the battle didn't force him to do anything. And then on top of that, the Gothic king was killed, which caused their entire, the alliance between the Goths and the Romans to fall apart, which severely weakened both of them, especially the Romans. And it wasn't, it wasn't like a long lasting defeat for Attila either, because even though he, he suffered pretty heavy losses at this battle, we don't have exact numbers, but a good portion of the army was killed, but he was still able to make it back to Hungary in one piece. And literally like nine months later, he was able to go back on campaign again. So it wouldn't, it was obviously wasn't too bad for him. So that's why I think that the battle of the Catalonian plains is a very overrated battle. Okay. And like I said, less than a year later, in the summer of 452, he was able to rally his army again and he ended up marching, once again, marching on the Western Empire. And this time, he wasn't bothering with France. He beelined right for Italy. So now he's, he's targeting the seat of imperial power. Yeah. His first target was the city of Aquileia which is in northeast Italy. It's almost, I think it's actually, it might be in Cro, in 
It's at Croatia now. No, I think it, it's like the very like northeastern most part of Italy on like the Adriatic coast. But the city of Aquileia. After a brief siege, the walls of Aquileia came down to Hun battering rams. All the, most of the inhabitants were massacred and the city was burned. There's a local legend in the area which might actually be true. There is a little bit of archaeological evidence that might support it. But the legend is that the survivors of the sacking of Aquileia ended up fleeing 60 miles north to an island lagoon which was protected. It was on an island inside like a harbor that served as like a natural fortress. And they fled there to keep themselves safe from the Huns. Those survivors ended up staying and building a city on top of the lagoon. And that city eventually became Venice. Oh, wow. Also, Aquileia still exists. It's like a small town. It has like 3000 people in it. It was a it was a pretty decent sized city at the time when it was burned, but now it's it, you know, it's a small town. But the cathedral in Aquileia today is built on top of the ruins of the old cathedral, which was burned by the Huns. And in parts of the cathedral, you can actually see bits and pieces of the original mural that was original to the first cathedral. That's dope. What's even crazier, some of those murals still have scorch marks on them. Oh, Christ. It's crazy. That's one. Of, that's on my bucket list, things I want to see if I have, whenever I take a trip to Europe, is I want to go see the cathedral in Aquileia. Honestly, I would love to just travel the world for a whole long time, to be honest, but I, I probably never have the money to do that. So the Huns went... The Huns went a little deeper into northern Italy. They sacked the cities of Pavia and Milan. And then as they moved southwest to the city of Mantua, an embassy arrived from Valentinian wanting to discuss peace. And this... I kind of said this about the invasion of France earlier. But the, this bo both of these are true. This is... Alongside the invasion of France, this is probably the most mythologized moment in Attila's entire history. Because the person who was in charge of the embassy that was meeting with him to discuss peace was Pope Leo I. So we, and sadly, the reason that there's so much myth around this meeting literally the meeting of the leader of the Latin church and the scourge of God, Attila is of course it was going to, it was inevitably going to suffer from a lot of like myth making. And sadly we have no idea what was actually discussed in this meeting because none of the, None of the minutes or none of the accounts or anything about it survive. There are a few stories, though. One story goes that Attila was completely awestruck because when Leo entered into his presence, he was draped in a holy light that shone brighter than the sun and completely overwhelmed Attila and convinced him to abandon his expedition in Italy. Yeah, right. There's another story that goes that while they were talking, Attila got pissed off, and he tried to attack the Pope, but Leo was protected by an apparition of St. Peter wielding a sword. The ghost of St. Peter appeared out of nowhere with a sword and defended the Pope from the attacks of this barbarian king. It's a good story. In reality, what they probably talked about was that they probably just came and said, hey, take some gold and fuck off. And 
so that's what Attila did. He fucked off. Um, it was, of course, it was probably a bit more complicated than that. The Han army was, it was having trouble feeding itself because the harvest in Italy that year hadn't been very good. And they also might have been suffering from a, a, a malaria outbreak. And then on top of that, at around that time, the Eastern Emperor, this new emperor that had just come around, a guy named Marion, uh, had just started attacking Hun territories on the southern bank of the Danube, Danube River. That's another sip. Or is that three sips? Uh, Danube's three. Yeah. So all of this stuff, you know, he had already sacked a few cities. He had a lot of gold. He had a lot of slaves. He had this extra gold that the Pope gave him. So he had it home. He bounced. He came into Italy in order to get gold and to weaken the Roman emperor. And that's exactly what he did. Yeah. I uh, I forgot how short this campaign actually. This was a six month campaign. He destroyed three cities. Holy crap. In March of 453, Attila decided that he was going to have himself another wife. Polygamy. We don't know exactly how many wives he had. It was several. He had several. Only two of them are named. And one of them was this one that he's getting married to now. Okay. Her name was Ildiko. In the tradition of the Huns, the wedding ceremony was followed by an enormous feast where Attila got crazy blackout drunk. Sounds about right. With the help of his friends, he stumbled back to bed and fell asleep next to his new bride. As he slept, the blood vessels in his sinuses hemorrhaged and caused a bad nosebleed. The blood ran back into his throat and he asphyxiated in his sleep. Ildiko woke up the next morning and found his dead body next to her. Bet you weren't expecting that, were you? No, I was not. Yeah, the uh, the ignoble end of the scourge of God. Just a giant ass nosebleed. Yeah, some, some medical experts have actually worked with historians and proposed the idea. They've, they've formulated the theory that... Um, when somebody is an alcoholic and is a constant drinker of like a heavy drinker, it can actually weaken the, uh, the lining of the blood vessels in the sinuses, which can cause some pretty bad, some pretty gnarly nosebleeds. And so after a night of drinking, like Attila had done, and after a lifetime of drinking, like was common in Hunnic culture, um, it's very likely that, uh, his that the nosebleed was just caused by like his chronic drinking, and that just by coincidence he was being being like passed out drunk and on his back. It just is just a combination of circumstances led to him asphyxiating on a nosebleed. I mean, still that's a funny kind of weird way to die. Oh, I got a nosebleed. Yeah. Especially for a man like Attila. What a wild way to die. After his death, the Hunnic Empire was inherited by three of Attila's sons. He had several, but these were the three ones that inherited the throne. Elak, Dengizic, and Ernak. The three brothers hated each other, and their rivalry severely weakened the Huns' military ability and destabilized their political system. As that tends to do. Subjects of the Huns took the opportunity to gain their freedom from the Huns and ended up revolting, uh, just taking advantage of the weakness of their political system at that moment. The What's considered to be the end of the Hunnic Empire came at the Battle of Nadao in 454, literally a year after Attila's death. Oh, wow. That quickly? That quickly. A German tribe called the Gepids annihilated the armies of the Huns and killed Elak. With such a large part of the army destroyed, they were unable to suppress revolts and their empire collapsed. 
some smaller groups of Huns would persist, kind of their traditional nomadic lifestyle, just traveling around Europe, raiding where they could, uh, selling themselves as mercenaries where they, where wherever they were needed. But by the seventh century, seventh century at the latest, they were completely gone from history, just never mentioned again. Wow. But some modern Hungarians claim that the Hungarian people are descended from the Huns, and some of the country even consider Attila a national hero. I think I mentioned that before. I think you did. In the 470s, now we're at this point, we're getting into, we're getting out of the Huns and we're getting into what happened to the Roman Empire after Attila died. In the four, yeah, in the four seventies, there is a German commander in the tattered remnants of the Western armies. This guy's name was Odoacer, or Odoacer, I think is actually the proper term. Odoacer. He was the commander of Federati troops, which is what the Romans called soldiers who were recruited from the outside the empire. So non non-Roman citizens who were enlisted. And so all of his troops were dip from different German tribes. In 475, the emperor Julius Nepos was overthrown by the magister militum of the army, Orestes. And Orestes took control of the government and named his infant son, Ra- and named his infant son, who was called Romulus Augustulus as the emperor, which is just the most stereotypically it's the name you give a child who you expect to be the emperor of the Roman Empire. But. And then the following year in 476, that guy Odoacer led his German troops and overthrew Orestes. They forced the young emperor the infant emperor romulus augustulus into exile odoacer declared himself the king of italy and there would never be a western roman emperor again interesting 476 is often seen as the date both of the fall of the roman empire and the start of the middle ages wow i didn't know there was a correlation between the two yeah, the the beginning of the Middle Ages is considered to to be to start with the collapse of the Roman Empire. So 476 to I don't know, roughly 1500 is the Middle Ages. Okay. In the aftermath of the Hunnic collapse, the remaining Goths that still lived on the Pontic steppe north of the Danube migrated into the Roman province of Pannonia which is Pannonia is now modern. Today it's parts of, it made up parts of Hungary, Slovakia, Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia. Pressure from the Eastern Roman, military pressure from the Eastern Roman Empire eventually forced them to migrate west into Italy. And this is after, this is, a, this is around the same time that the Roman Empire is collapsing. In 493, these Goths, under their now legendary king, a guy named Theodoric the Great, captured the city of Ravenna, killed Odoacer, and founded the Ostrogothic kingdom in Italy. They'd end up ruling Italy for a few generations until, I think, it was, yeah, it was, it was less than 100 years. They'd eventually be conquered by a guy that I'm going to be talking about in a future episode. And who is that? I guess we'll find out. (laughs) I'm not giving you anything. (laughs) You jackass. The earlier group of Goths, the first group of Goths that originally crossed over the the Danube uh, when the Huns first arrived in Europe, By this point, they controlled large parts of southern France and the Iberian Peninsula. They founded 
the Visigothic kingdom. They would end up ruling in what's now modern day Spain until the Arab expansions in the 8th century when they were finally conquered by the Muslim Umayyad Caliphate. That is 300 years. That's a pretty long time, to be honest. Another of the Huns' vassals who migrated into the dying remnants of the Western Empire were another German tribe that I haven't mentioned so far. They were called the Franks. The Franks settled in northern Gaul, and over the course of the next few centuries would grow in power and organization until the 9th century, the Frankish king Karl the Great, also known as Charlemagne, conquered all of Gaul, Germany, and northern Italy, and was crowned emperor of the Romans by the Pope. The successors to his empire would go on to found the Kingdom of France, and the Holy Roman Empire, the precursor to modern Germany. What? Well, I didn't know the Holy Roman Empire was the precursor to Germany. Yeah, it was It was the, the area that's now Germany was controlled by the Holy Roman Empire. It was a... Uh, it's just complicated, but the, the Holy Roman Empire, it, it was eventually destroyed by Napoleon, and then that allowed the uh, that allowed one of the like we talked about with uh, Frederick um, uh, after the Holy Roman Empire was destroyed by Napoleon. Then the Prussian, the Kingdom of Prussia, was able to unite Germany into the Empire of Germany, and that's where modern Germany comes from. Okay, yeah, the first Frankish king was. So he was a guy, he was a the son of he was the son of a Frankish nobleman and a Roman and a Roman woman. So he was half Frankish, half Roman. His name was Hlodowig or Holodovig, which is a really weird name to pronounce. It starts with an H. He was the first Frankish king. He established the kingdom in the the decaying guts of the Roman Empire in the year 507. In English, his name is usually translated as Clovis. But in France, he's better known as Louis I. Oh, wow. The monarchy that he established in the ruins of the Roman Empire survived continuously until his distant successor, Louis XVI, got his head cut off by some Jacobins in 1793 during the French Revolution. Jacobins sounds like a random insult you came up with out of nowhere, but I know it's not. I said I was about to say, I know it's not. It's just it sounds like that, you know? The Jacobins were a, uh, a complicated people, but anyways. So... The Eastern Roman Empire, based on because I've I've mentioned so far, I'm saying the collapse of the Roman Empire, the fall of the the Roman Empire, but it's really only the fall of the Western Empire. The Eastern Empire, based in Constantinople, lived on. It ended up becoming one of the major superpowers in medieval Europe, known more commonly today as the Byzantine Empire. It, this is, I've, I study, like, my my area of study when I'm in school is the late Roman Empire and or the early medieval period. The, the amount of time that the Roman Empire continues to exist after the supposed fall of the Roman Empire is mind-boggling to me. They almost survive into the modern age. But because of repeated invasions by Muslim Turkish forces over several, a couple centuries, ate away more and more of its territory until eventually only the city of Constantinople itself was left in the empire. 
the Theodosian walls, which were the def- the defenses, those walls that were rebuilt in two months to stop Attila, were finally brought down by a Turkish army with the help of gunpowder cannons in 1453. Wow. 1453. A thousand years after the fall of the Western Empire. A thousand years. Holy crap. The Ottoman Empire, just like the Goths a thousand years before, became the final inheritors of the Roman Empire. Honestly, it sounds like Attila the Hun was, wasn't as, like, yes, his, I guess his tactics normally were savage compared to at least the times, but like, he, it, a lot of what I know, which obviously isn't very accurate, is he was just brutal, savage, barely human. A lot, a, a lot of the propaganda that we originally got about Native Americans back in the day, but I, I know it's not the same way, but that it's crazy to think it was more complicated than that, and you never revisit it or think about it. Yeah. Yeah, to a lot of people, the idea of engaging with a figure like Attila the Hun seems like such a foreign concept because he, because of all of literally like almost like 1500 years of propaganda about this guy. And he is. And then when you act, you, you can't fathom. Like trying to understand a person with this kind of reputation as some somebody with three dimensions, something I, I meant to put in here. I forgot to do it, but um, when Priscus went and visited the court of Attila, um, one of the things that stuck out, stuck out to me the most was um, Priscus actually mentions that during the feasts and the banquets that they would host, while the Roman delegation was there, he was always sitting right next to his youngest son and was always like laughing and playing with him and showing like love and affection like a father would. And the idea, the idea of seeing like, like imagine, like try to imagine your own father or a mentor or somebody who's shown you like a parental figure who you love dearly and has shown affection for and try to imagine them uh, commanding an army that burns down a city and kills its inhabitants. The multifaceted aspects of this man are so almost overwhelming to kind of ponder and think about. Is he obviously had a very deep intellect he was very worldly very grounded and saw the world with a very objective lens and a man like that with so many what we would call admirable traits were would he probably was responsible personally responsible for tens of thousands potentially hundreds of thousands of deaths it's wild thing to think about and something that something that you can't appreciate if you just take the the histories and the the slanted stories that we have about him at face value so yeah you have you have any more thoughts uh not really i i'm just kind of like i guess the west best way to put it is like shocked at how misrepresented our image of him yeah yeah pro- probably the most misunderstood person that we've talked about on this podcast so far <laughs> do you have any final thoughts before we go Derek um uh no I just uh I'll go ahead and give my sources real quick my sources for this were uh the End of Empire, Attila the Hun and the Fall of Rome by Christopher Kelly, and Attila, the Barbarian King Who Challenged Rome by John Mann. 
Um, yeah. So what are our, uh, what are those things you usually plug at the end of our shows? Well, where can they find you first, Derek? Oh, they can find me on Twitter. People keep saying Twitter is going to disappear soon, but it hasn't disappeared yet. So I'll just act on the assumption that it's sticking around for a little bit. It's here for now and we'll use it till it's gone. <laughs> my Twitter, I forgot to mention this. My Twitter is at Visigoth. The I is a one, the O is a zero. My profile picture is actually a picture, a painting of Alaric, who is the guy who sacked Rome in 410. The father of the general who died at the Battle of Catalonian Plains. So I thought, so yeah, throw that out there. And you can find me at Tim, a.k.a. Otis. And you can find the podcast on Twitter at Alex Society Pod. And then on Facebook and Instagram at the Alexander Society Pod. If you enjoyed this program, please give it a rate or review on your favorite so streaming platform of choice. And have a good day. And we'll see you next time. Bye.